If Philip Chisholm didn't start hearing voices when he's 10, then there is no evidence that Philip Chisholm began experiencing psychosis at 10. And if Philip Chisholm wasn't hearing voices, and the only basis I would suggest to you of that opinion was Philip Chisholm, then Philip Chisholm isn't mentally ill. In the hushed halls of justice, the echoes of a solemn gavel resound as life sentences are handed down to some of the most dangerous kids in society, once innocent and full of promise, now faced with the reality of spending their entire lives behind bars. The courtroom drama unfolds as emotions run high, leaving us to ponder how these young souls react when confronted with the gravity of their crimes. Join us as we delve into the complex psyche of these youthful offenders, exploring their reactions to their sentences. Josh Phillips. Josh Phillips, convicted of the murder of his eight-year-old neighbor, Maddie Clifton, received a life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years. This verdict came after Phillips' conviction on charges of first-degree murder, which occurred in November 1998, when he was just 14 years old. Understanding Josh Phillips' reaction to his life sentence requires delving into the circumstances surrounding the crime, his demeanor during the trial, and any subsequent statements or actions that shed light on his mindset and emotions. The murder of Maddie Clifton shocked the community of Jacksonville, Florida, and garnered widespread media attention. Maddie's disappearance on November 3, 1998, sparked a massive search effort involving law enforcement and volunteers from the neighborhood. Tragically, her body was discovered a week later hidden beneath Josh Phillips's waterbed in his family's home. She had been beaten and stabbed to death. In the aftermath of Maddie's murder, Josh Phillips was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Despite his young age at the time of the crime, the severity of his actions and the brutal nature of Maddie's death led prosecutors to seek a life sentence without the possibility of parole. During his trial, Josh Phillips's demeanor and behavior painted a complex picture. On one hand, he was described as a quiet and introverted teenager who showed little emotion in court. Some observers interpreted his stoic demeanor as a sign of remorselessness or detachment from the gravity of his actions. Others saw it as a defense mechanism, a way for Phillips to cope with the overwhelming stress and trauma of his situation. Phillips's defense team argued that his actions were the result of a tragic accident rather than premeditated murder. They claimed that Phillips had accidentally struck Maddie with a baseball bat while they were playing in his room and that he panicked and hid her body out of fear. However, prosecutors painted a different picture, presenting evidence that Phillips had deliberately attacked Maddie with the intent to kill her. Ultimately, the jury found Phillips guilty of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 25 years. The verdict elicited a range of reactions from Phillips's family, friends, and the broader community. For Phillips himself, the reality of his life sentence likely came as a shock. At just 14 years old, he faced the prospect of spending the rest of his life behind bars, with little hope of ever being released. This realization may have been overwhelming, leaving Phillips feeling scared, confused, and uncertain about his future. In the years following his conviction, Phillips has had time to reflect on his actions and come to terms with the consequences of his crime. While little is known about his thoughts and feelings since his sentencing, he possibly had been experiencing a range of emotions, including remorse, regret, and a desire for redemption. For Maddie Clifton's family, the life sentence handed down to Josh Phillips brought a sense of closure and justice. While nothing could ever fully heal the pain of losing their daughter, knowing that her killer would be held accountable for his actions provided some measure of comfort. In the broader community, Maddie's murder served as a sobering reminder of the fragility of life and the importance of vigilance in protecting children from harm. The case sparked conversations about child safety and the need for parents and caregivers to remain vigilant in protecting their children from potential dangers. Ultimately, Josh Phillips' life sentence serves as a stark reminder of the devastating consequences of violence and the profound impact it can have on individuals, families, and communities. As Phillips continues to serve his sentence behind bars, his case serves as a cautionary tale and a reminder of the importance of seeking justice for victims and holding perpetrators accountable for their actions. Dylan Roof in another interesting yet devastating murder tale is Dylan Roof, a name that will forever be associated with one of the darkest chapters in American history. Born on April 3, 1994 in Columbia, South Carolina, Roof grew up in a broken home. His parents divorced when he was just a child, leaving him to navigate the complexities of life without a stable family. Structure. As he entered his teenage years, Roof began to exhibit signs of deep-seated anger and resentment. It was during this time that Roof's racist beliefs started to take hold. He immersed himself in 
and online forums and websites that propagated white supremacist ideologies. These platforms became an echo chamber for his hatred, feeding his distorted views of the world and fueling his desire to take action. Roof's radicalization reached its peak in the months leading up to the Charleston Church Massacre. He became fixated on the idea of starting a race war, believing that it was his duty to ignite the flames of racial division. His targets were clear, African Americans, whom he saw as a threat to the white race. On the evening of June 17, 2015, Roof put his sinister plan into motion. He entered the historic Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, under the pretense of joining a Bible study session. Little did the unsuspecting victims know that they were about to face unimaginable horror. As the Bible study group gathered in the church's basement, Roof sat among them, seemingly blending in. But behind his calm facade, a storm was brewing. With a heart filled with hatred, he pulled out a Glock .45 caliber handgun and opened fire on the innocent worshipers. Roof's act of violence sent shockwaves throughout the nation, leaving communities devastated and a country grappling with the harsh reality of racial hatred. The Charleston Church Massacre became a stark reminder that racism still lingers in the darkest corners of society, ready to rear its ugly head. But as the investigation unfolded, a chilling revelation emerged. Roof's intentions went beyond the act of murder. He wanted to ignite a racial war, to sow the seeds of division and chaos. His actions were not those of a troubled young man seeking attention. They were calculated and driven by a twisted ideology. As we move forward in this story, we will explore the courtroom proceedings that followed Roof's arrest, the emotional impact on the victim's families, and the ultimate verdict that would seal his fate. The courtroom was a battleground where the victim's families, survivors, and the public came face to face with the man who had shattered their lives. Dylan Roof, the perpetrator of the Charleston Church Massacre, sat stoically in his orange jumpsuit, his eyes fixed on the proceedings that would determine his fate. The prosecution presented a compelling case, meticulously laying out the evidence against Roof. They played chilling audio recordings of his confession, in which he expressed his racist motivations and his desire to start a race war. As the families poured out their hearts about their lost loved ones, Roof sat there seemingly unaffected. His lack of remorse only fueled the fire of their anger. They demanded justice, a punishment that would reflect the magnitude of his crimes. Although the defense portrayed Roof as troubled, influenced by extremism, the prosecution countered, emphasizing a calculated nature of actions. Alas, Roof was found guilty on all counts. The courtroom erupted in applause and tears, a collective sigh of relief from the victim's families and the community. Justice had been served, and Roof would face the consequences of his heinous crimes. But the story didn't end there. As the judge prepared to deliver the sentence, a shift occurred in Roof's demeanor. For the first time, a flicker of emotion crossed his face. It was a mix of anger, frustration, and perhaps even fear. He realized that his life was about to change forever. The judge, known for his stern and unwavering approach to justice, sentenced Roof to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The courtroom fell silent once again, this time with a sense of closure. As Roof was led away, his eyes met those of the victim's families. There was a glimmer of satisfaction in their eyes, a sense of justice finally being served. Philip Chisholm. It all began on October 22, 2013, at Danvers High School in Massachusetts. Colleen Ritzer, a beloved math teacher, asked her student, Philip Chisholm, to stay after school. Little did she know that this seemingly ordinary request would lead to a horrifying chain of events. Chisholm, a 14-year-old at the time, had recently moved to Massachusetts from Clarksville, Tennessee. Ritzer, known for her caring nature, tried to engage Chisholm in light conversation, asking him about his new community. However, something seemed to unsettle him, and the conversation took a dark turn. Another student, who had also stayed late that day, testified that Chisholm became visibly upset during the conversation, prompting Ritzer to change the subject. Moments later, Ritzer left her classroom and headed towards the women's restroom. Surveillance footage from the school's 140 cameras captured the chilling moments that followed. Chisholm poked his head out of Ritzer's classroom, looking down the hall before returning with his hood on and a pair of gloves. He entered the bathroom and minutes later emerged carrying the black pants Ritzer had been wearing. Prosecutors would later reveal the gruesome some details of the crime. Ritzer had been raped twice, her throat had been slit, and she had been strangled. The brutality of the attack was unimaginable, leaving no doubt that Chisholm had gone to school that day with a terrible purpose. But the horror didn't end there. Prosecutors alleged that Chisholm used a recycling bin to move Ritzer's lifeless body to a wooded area outside the school, where the attack continued. The medical examiner testified that the violence was so extreme that it was impossible to determine if Ritzer was already dead before being moved. As the investigation 
investigation unfolded, authorities discovered chilling evidence in Chisholm's backpack. Inside, they found a box cutter, a mask, gloves, and a hooded sweatshirt, all pointing to his premeditation of the crime. The shocking details of the crime sent shockwaves through the community of Danvers and the nation as a whole. The senseless and brutal nature of Ritzer's murder left everyone searching for answers and justice. The trial of Philip Chisholm was marked by intense emotions and gripping testimonies. Prosecutors painted a chilling picture of Chisholm's actions on that fateful day, presenting the jury with portions of surveillance video from Danvers High School. As the trial progressed, it became clear that Chisholm's defense attorneys did not contest his involvement in the crime. Instead, they argued that he was suffering from a psychotic disorder at the time of the slaying. However, the prosecution vehemently refuted this claim, asserting that Chisholm's actions were premeditated and not the result of mental illness. In closing arguments, Assistant District Attorney Kate McDougall made a powerful statement to the jurors. She emphasized that doing something awful doesn't make a person crazy, challenging them to be certain beyond a reasonable doubt that Chisholm was not mentally ill. Finally, after nine hours of deliberation over two days, the verdict was reached. Philip Chisholm was found guilty of first-degree murder, aggravated rape, and armed robbery. However, he was found not guilty on a second charge of aggravated rape. As the guilty verdicts were read, Chisholm showed no emotion and stared straight ahead. His lack of reaction only added to the chilling nature of his crimes. In contrast, the victim's family, particularly her mother, could not contain their grief. The trial concluded with a status hearing scheduled for a later date to discuss sentencing. Due to being tried as a juvenile, Chisholm will reportedly be sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 to 25 years. The verdict and the subsequent sentencing left many questioning the justice system and the appropriate punishment for such heinous crimes committed by a juvenile. Conrad Schaefer Conrad Schaefer, a name that has sent shockwaves through the legal world, recently found himself in the center of a high-profile court case that would ultimately determine his fate. From the initial arrest to the dramatic courtroom proceedings, every step of Schaefer's journey is filled with sensational twists and turns that will leave you on the edge of your seat. It was a day that forever changed the quiet community of Osceola, Florida. On April 15, 2016, tragedy struck in the form of a senseless shooting spree that left multiple lives lost and a community shattered. At the center of it all was a teenager named Conrad Schaefer, whose actions would send shockwaves through the town and lead to a courtroom drama that captivated the nation. The day began like any other in Osceola, but it would soon take a dark and tragic turn. Conrad Schaefer, just 18 years old at the time, embarked on a shooting spree that would claim the lives of several individuals and leave the community reeling in shock and disbelief. As the shots rang out and chaos ensued, residents scrambled for safety, unaware of the horror that was unfolding around them. As the details of the shooting spree emerged, authorities worked tirelessly to piece together the events leading up to the tragedy and hold those responsible accountable for their actions. Conrad Schaefer was apprehended by law enforcement officers and brought to trial to face charges for his role in the senseless violence. The trial, a spectacle of legal drama, would serve as a platform for prosecutors to present evidence against Schaefer and seek justice for the victims and their families. The prosecution wasted no time in presenting a compelling case against Schaefer meticulously laying out the evidence that linked him to the crimes. The defense, on the other hand, painted a picture of a man who had been wrongly accused, highlighting inconsistencies in the investigation and raising doubts about the credibility of the witnesses. Throughout the trial, Schaefer's reactions were closely scrutinized. Some described him as emotionless, while others saw glimpses of anger and frustration. As the prosecution presented graphic details of the murders, Schaefer's face remained stoic, betraying little emotion. It was as if he had built an impenetrable wall around himself, shielding his true thoughts and feelings from the prying eyes of the courtroom. Schaefer's lack of visible emotion can be interpreted in different ways. Some may see it as a sign of guilt, an attempt to distance himself from the horrific acts he is accused of. Others argue that it could be a coping mechanism, a way for him to detach himself from the gravity of the situation. Regardless, his demeanor has captivated the public and fueled speculation about his true nature. After careful consideration of the evidence presented and the arguments made by both the prosecution and the defense, the jury has reached a verdict. On the charge of multiple counts of first-degree murder, the jury finds the defendant, Conrad Schaefer, guilty. Schaefer's face remained impassive, but a flicker of emotion passed through his eyes. Guilty. The weight of the word hung heavy in the air, a final verdict that would forever alter the course of Schaefer's life. With the guilty verdict delivered, it was time for the sentencing phase of the trial. The prosecution called for the harshest punishment, arguing that Schaefer's crimes warranted a life sentence without the possibility of parole. The families of the victims victims found solace in the judge's decision, knowing that Schaefer would never walk free again. It was a bittersweet victory, a small measure of closure in the face of unimaginable loss. Shiondell Jackson
Shandell Jackson, born in the year 1985, found himself at the center of a harrowing crime that shook the University of Wisconsin community. In February 2010, the trial began for the attempted robbery and murder of Nathan Potter, a promising student whose life was tragically cut short. As the courtroom filled with anticipation, the jury prepared to deliver their verdict, determining the fate of Shandell Jackson. The evidence presented during the trial painted a grim picture of the events that unfolded on that fateful day. It was revealed that Jackson, driven by greed and a desire desire for quick money had targeted Potter in a botched robbery attempt. The prosecution meticulously laid out the sequence of events, highlighting Jackson's calculated actions and the devastating consequences they had on Potter's family and friends. Witnesses testified to the chilling details of the crime, recounting the terror and chaos that ensued. Jackson's defense team attempted to cast doubt on the evidence, but the overwhelming weight of the facts left little room for doubt. The jury, after careful deliberation, reached their verdict. As the tension in the courtroom reached its peak, the jury delivered their verdict. Guilty. The words echoed through the room, piercing the hearts of those present, but it was Jackson's reaction that sent shockwaves through the courtroom. With a cold, unremorseful gaze, he turned to Potter's grieving family and mouthed insults, adding salt to their already deep wounds. The audacity and lack of empathy displayed by Jackson were met with disbelief and outrage. The courtroom was filled with gasps and murmurs as the family struggled to comprehend the callousness of his actions. But Jackson's defiance did not end there. As he was being escorted out of the courtroom, a smirk played on his lips, a chilling reminder of the darkness that resided within him. It was clear that Jackson had no remorse for the pain he had caused, and his actions only further solidified the severity of his crimes. The sentencing hearing in April 2010 provided another opportunity for Jackson to display his true nature. As he glanced at Potter's family once again, officers immediately pounced on him, determined to prevent any further disrespect. A brief struggle ensued, but Jackson was quickly subdued, pepper sprayed, and restrained by three officers before being forcibly removed from the room. The courtroom was left in a state of shock and disbelief. The callousness and lack of remorse exhibited by Shondell Jackson during his trial and sentencing painted a chilling portrait of a man consumed by darkness. His actions and reactions only served to deepen the pain and trauma experienced by Potter's loved ones. After Shondell Jackson's shocking display of defiance and lack of remorse during his trial and sentencing, the impact on Nathan Potter's family and the community was profound. The pain and trauma inflicted by Jackson's actions were further exacerbated by his callous behavior in the courtroom. Potter's family, already grappling with the devastating loss of their loved one, had to endure the additional anguish of witnessing Jackson's disrespectful gestures and insults. Their grief was compounded by the realization that the man responsible for their son's death showed no remorse for his heinous crime. Bever Brothers Michael and Robert Bever, two brothers from Tulsa, Oklahoma, were accused of committing one of the most shocking crimes in recent memory. In 2015, they brutally murdered their parents and three of their siblings, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. The details of this case are truly horrifying, and the impact on the community cannot be overstated. The motive behind the killings was revealed to be a desire for notoriety and a plan to carry out a mass murder inspired by violent video games and other media. The brothers meticulously planned the attack, stocking up on weapons and crafting makeshift body armor to carry out their plan. After the murders, Robert and Michael Beaver were arrested and charged with multiple counts of first-degree murder and other related offenses. Both brothers initially pleaded not guilty to the charges, but Robert later changed his plea to guilty in exchange for a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Michael, on the other hand, opted to stand trial. The trial took place at the Tulsa County Courthouse, where the Bever brothers faced the consequences of their actions. Michael Bever, the younger of the two, was escorted through the halls by his defense attorney, Corbin Brewster, as the world watched in disbelief. The courtroom was filled with tension and anticipation as the prosecution presented their case against the brothers. Graphic evidence related to the Bever family murders was released during the trial, shocking the public and further solidifying the severity of the crimes committed. The jury was faced with the difficult task of determining the appropriate punishment for these heinous acts. Finally, after weeks of emotional testimony and deliberation, the judge handed down the sentence. It was was a moment that would change the lives of the Bever brothers forever. The severity of the punishment sent shockwaves through the courtroom and the nation as a whole. The impact of the Beaver brothers' actions extended far beyond their immediate family. The surviving sister, who miraculously survived the attack, faced physical and emotional scars that will never fully heal. The community was left grappling with the unimaginable loss and the question of how such a tragedy could occur. As the courtroom drama unfolded, the defense immediately announced their plans to appeal the decision. 
decision. They argued that the sentence was too harsh and sought a reconsideration. The legal battle was far from over, adding another layer of complexity to an already shocking case. As the judge pronounced the sentence, a heavy silence fell over the courtroom. Michael and Robert Bever, who had shown little emotion throughout the trial, now faced the reality of spending the rest of their lives behind bars. The weight of their actions and the severity of their punishment seemed to finally sink in. Michael Beaver, the younger brother, appeared stunned, his eyes wide with disbelief. It was as if he couldn't comprehend the magnitude of the sentence handed down to him. The realization that he would likely never experience freedom again was a devastating blow. The weight of a lifetime spent in prison without the possibility of parole hung heavily upon him. Robert Bever, the older brother who had already pleaded guilty to the murders, displayed a stoic demeanor. He had accepted his fate long before the sentencing, but the gravity of the moment was still palpable. The family members of the victims who had endured unimaginable pain and loss looked on with mixed emotions. While the sentence brought some sense of justice, it could never fully heal the wounds left by the Bever brothers' actions. Their lives had been forever shattered, and the scars would remain for a lifetime. The Bever brothers' reaction to their sentence in court was a moment that will forever be etched in the memories of those who witnessed it. The weight of their actions and the consequences they now faced were undeniable. Alyssa Bustamante in a small rural town west of Jefferson City, Missouri, a horrifying crime took place that would send shockwaves through the community and the nation. Alyssa Bustamante, a troubled teenager, committed an act so heinous and unimaginable that it would forever change the lives of those involved. It was in October 2009 when Alyssa, then just 15 years old, carried out a chilling plan. Driven by a dark curiosity, she strangled, cut, and stabbed nine-year-old Elizabeth Olton. The motive? Alyssa wanted to know how it felt to take someone's life. The sheer brutality of the crime sent shivers down the spines of everyone who heard the details. But the horror didn't end there. After ending Elizabeth's young life, Alyssa led the authorities to a shallow grave in the woods behind their neighborhood. Under a blanket of leaves, Elizabeth's lifeless body lay hidden, a tragic testament to the depths of Alyssa's depravity. The discovery of the crime sent shockwaves through the tight-knit community, leaving neighbors and friends in disbelief. How could someone so young commit such a heinous act? The search for answers would lead to a courtroom, where Alyssa would face the consequences of her actions. The courtroom proceedings surrounding Alyssa Bustamante's case were filled with tension, emotion, and a deep sense of grief. As the trial unfolded, the shocking details of the crime were laid bare for all to hear, leaving those in attendance stunned. Alyssa, now 18 years old, stood before the judge, her hands shackled to her waist and her feet shackled together. Facing Elizabeth's grieving mother and siblings, she struggled to find the right words to express her remorse. Tears streamed down her face as she took a deep breath and said, I know words can never be enough and they can never adequately describe how horrible I feel for all of this. If I could give my life to get her back, I would. I'm sorry. Elizabeth's mother, Patty Price, who had previously expressed her hatred for Alyssa, sat silently, her eyes fixed forward. The weight of the tragedy was palpable in the courtroom, as the pain of loss and the devastation caused by Alyssa's actions hung heavy in the air. The defense attorneys argued for a sentence less than life in prison, presenting Alyssa's use of the antidepressant Prozac as a contributing factor to her violent tendencies. They revealed her long-standing battle with depression depression and her previous suicide attempt by overdosing on painkillers. However, the prosecution sought a longer sentence, highlighting the premeditation and chilling details of the crime. It was revealed that Alyssa had dug two graves in advance, indicating a level of planning that sent chills down the spines of those listening. Additionally, she had sent her younger sister to lure Elizabeth outside with an invitation to play on the evening of the killing. Testimony from Missouri State Highway Patrol Sergeant David Rice painted a disturbing picture of Alyssa's mindset. She she had expressed a desire to know what it felt like to kill someone, a revelation that left the courtroom in disbelief. Journal entries found in Alyssa's diary were read aloud, revealing her twisted exhilaration at the act of taking a life. I strangled them and slit their throat and stabbed them. Now they're dead, Alyssa had written. I don't know how to feel ATM. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the oh my god I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. Kay, I gotta go to church now, lol. As the trial concluded, the judge delivered the sentence that would forever alter Alyssa's life. She was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole, a decision that left the courtroom in a state of somber reflection. Morgan Leppert.
In the dark corners of the criminal world, there are stories that defy belief and challenge our understanding of human nature. Morgan Leppert's journey is one such story. At just 15 years old, she was involved in a brutal slaying that shocked an entire community. Morgan Leppert's journey into darkness began on a seemingly ordinary day in 2008. At the tender age of 15, she found herself entangled in a web of violence and brutality that would forever change her life. It was in the quiet town of Palatka, Florida, that Morgan's path took a sinister turn. Alongside her then-boyfriend, Toby Lowry, she embarked on a path of destruction that would leave an indelible mark on the community. On that fateful day, Morgan and Toby entered the home of 66-year-old Ruth Wittenberg, an unsuspecting woman who would become the victim of their heinous act. What transpired within those walls was a nightmare beyond imagination. The details of the crime are too gruesome to recount, but suffice it to say, it was a scene of unspeakable horror. Ruth Wittenberg's life was brutally taken, and the shock waves reverberated through the community, leaving everyone in a state of disbelief. As the investigation unfolded, the truth began to emerge, painting a picture of a crime that defied comprehension. Morgan Leppert, a young girl with her whole life ahead of her, had become entangled in a web of darkness and violence. The community was left grappling with the question of how such evil could reside within someone so young. The trial that followed would provide some answers, but it would also reveal the shocking depths of Morgan Leppert's involvement in the crime. As the trial progressed, the tension in the courtroom reached its peak. Morgan Leppert, now 16 years old, sat in the defendant's chair, her eyes darting nervously around the room. The weight of the evidence against her was undeniable, and the prosecution made sure to leave no room for doubt. Throughout the trial, Morgan's demeanor was a mix of defiance and vulnerability. At times, she appeared detached, as if trying to distance herself from the gravity of her actions. But there were moments when her facade cracked, revealing glimpses of the turmoil within. One such moment came when the prosecution played a chilling recording of Morgan Leppert confessing to the murder. The sound of her own voice, cold and devoid of remorse, echoed through the courtroom, sending shivers down the spines of those present. It was a pivotal moment that left everyone in disbelief. Morgan's reaction was a chilling reminder of the darkness that resided within her. Her eyes widened, her face contorted with a mix of anger and resignation. It was as if she was confronting the reality of her actions for the first time. Finally, the moment arrived. The judge, with a stern expression on his face, read out the sentence, life without the possibility of parole. The words hung heavy in the air, and Morgan's reaction was nothing short of shocking. She let out a piercing scream, her face contorted with rage and disbelief. It was a moment that will forever be etched in the memories of those present. The courtroom erupted in a mix of gasps and murmurs as the weight of the sentence sank in. But Morgan's outburst didn't end there. As she was let out of the courtroom, she lashed out at the guards, kicking and screaming. It was a display of defiance, a desperate attempt to cling to the last shreds of her freedom. Thank you for joining us on this gripping journey. Would you like to be informed about more stories like this? Click on the next video. Until next time.